Okay, go ahead, Robert. Oh, farm food safety, as if someone's life depended on it. This is an overview of good agricultural practices through on-farm risk assessment. Presenters today will be myself, Robert Haddad, Cornell Vegetable Program Regional Specialist, of Elizabeth Newbold, Local Food Distri Distribution and Marketing Specialist through Harvest New York, and Stephanie Mellenbacher, Horticulture Community Educator, uh, CCE Steuben County. So what is all the fuss about food safety? It's been in the news quite a, quite a bit. Uh, and what we want to do is give you the basics of farm food safety. Go through the alphabet of the different types of programs that are out there, whether it's, you know, we hear a lot about GAPS and FISMA. Uh, so it's the GAPS uh, is good agricultural practices. HGAPS is a harmonized version of GAPS. And FISMA stands for the Food Safety Modernization Act, FDA regulated program. So we want to make a case of incorporating food safety into your farming practices through writing a plan and go through uh, and let you know about available detailed trainings that will give you much more thorough information about how to put all this together. Produce safety is the issue and it's the right thing to do regardless if buyers are a requirement, which many are. And later on this year, in October of 2015, the uh, FISMA will make it regulatory for uh, farms that are, um, that will fall under compliance. But food safety is something that you want all the time. Nobody, because nobody wants to make anybody sick. A few years back, the Jensen brothers, an infamous food safety case where listeria became contaminated, uh, contaminated a lot of cantaloupe, where 34 consumers died over many states. It was the worst outbreak uh, and death toll in American history. Food safety went from being something that was being required by buyers and then being uh, regulated by the federal government to something that's being dictated by lawyers when you get right down to it. Food attorneys like Marlar Clark are the nation's leading lawyers representing victims of foodborne illnesses such as E. coli, salmonella, and listeria. He became famous going, uh, years ago with the, the, the infamous uh, Jack in the Box hamburger case, uh, where, and since then has gone after some of the biggest companies in the United States. Uh, besides the, uh, going after Cargill, Dole, Walmart, Wendy's, McDonald's, Nebraska Beef, um, during the cantaloupe outbreak, this law firm has gone after all the parties involved, including the certification agencies, third party, the, the third party uh, safety auditing firm, plus the 30 retailers who sold Jensen's products, including Wegmans. There's been over $600 million in settlements to date. So since buyers are requiring it for, for some growers, uh, what there are the, the types that they're looking for, usually right here in New York, are, are the gaps or harmonized gaps. There are other third party certifications, particularly if you're a fruit grower, there may be global gaps um, and, and, and different types. So you need to know which ones that your buyers are requiring. Having these types of programs, it is kind of a nuisance and a pain to go through, but if that's what it takes to get you into a market, then that is required. We're looking on the, from the federal side, the Food Safety Modernization Act will make it a re regulation. Uh, some very small farms may be exempt, uh, but uh, larger produce farms will be required to comply. It, the, so the, the requirements will be similar as GAPS, but, doesn't ha but does have some important differences like water testing schedules. So why is it the right thing to do? Risks exist on the farm, but you may not always think about them. And you may be doing a lot of these things already because a lot of it is common sense. So you first you have to identify and understand where the risks may be coming from. Um, the biological side is the most important because it, this is where the majority of people get sick from. 
It's all about reducing microbial risk in each step of the production and handling cycle. We're not looking for something that, for, for zero sterilization, that's impossible. The best thing that we can do is look for uh, this, this minim minimization of risk. Pathogens, foodborne illnesses are germs. And when you have an outbreak, it's because there's enough germs in the right place at the right time under the right environmental conditions with people who are susceptible to it. We're seeing a lot more of this happening because of many factors, one being that the microorganisms are changing, like listeria, for instance, can survive and actually grow in colder, wetter conditions. E. coli H157 uh, didn't even exist, as far as we know, prior to the early 80s. It's, it's something that's it's an E. coli that is, has mutated into a pathogenic form. We also have a changing po uh, population. We have more elderly. Uh, pregnant women, small children are, are more susceptible. They, immunocompromised people, people who have had uh, organ transplants or other uh, blood type diseases uh, are much more susceptible uh, to, to foodborne illnesses. And plus there's a lot more, uh, there, there's these changes in food preferences. We're eating a lot more fresh produce because uh, you know, we're looking to improve our nutrition. So it's ready to eat foods, uh, finger foods. I mean, how many times have we seen at farmer's markets uh, people picking up um, cartons of, of snap beans and, uh, or sweet peas, not sweet peas, snap peas, excuse me, um, and having um, and children eating right out of the box. What we do here in New York uh, is that we give you a very extensive training, two days. We lay, uh, lay out of the course uh, with, with day one with a, a very uh, thorough explanation of what good agricultural practices are. We go through step by step, giving you as much detail as possible. We encourage discussion. We, we really uh, press on uh, risk assessment and looking at each aspect of farming practices. So we break it down into, into pieces. Uh, so we start off with looking at worker training. There's a lot of record keeping, unfortunately, and that's where a lot of the time and expense comes in. Uh, we also cover pre-harvest water management, manure, compost management, wildlife, livestock, and domesticated animal management, harvest and post-harvest practices, post-harvest water use, packing house sanitation, transportation, and traceability. Workers are food handlers. They may be the last person who touch, touches produce from your farm before it goes into a consumer's mouth. So in, all, in, in essence, all of your farm workers are food handlers. So we need to make sure that they are trained to be able to handle these products carefully uh, without uh, passing on any types of contamination. Uh, th through that, uh, training is essential, and there's a lot of um, references and resources available to help with that type of training. Looking at pre-harvest water management, irrigation out in the field, uh, as mentioned before, we're looking to minimize risk. So method of application of irrigation water is essential. If you're using surface water, then uh, trickle irrigation uh, makes it uh, less risky than using overhead. Uh, if you're using municipal water, well, that's the cleanest, uh, safest water systems that there are uh, at your disposal. Uh, and so combining that with, um, with, the, with your irrigation, then you've got probably the lowest risk possible. But if you're drawing water out of a well, well needs to be tested uh, at least twice a season. So we can tell, you, you, can, be, you can be sure that there are uh, any contamination that has managed to work its way in, especially if it's an older well. Surface water testing is, is really, really important. Uh, a, a lot of farms depend on ponds, uh, creeks, the Erie Canal, uh, a, a lots of these waterways that are, uh, that are very susceptible to contamination from other sources out of your control. So testing on a regular basis is critical. Manure management, if you're using raw manure, looking to avoid cross-contamination, looking to avoid uh, any types of practices 
uh, that uh, that could enhance our runoff. So you're, you're looking to, to reduce any type of runoff from where manure might be stored. Uh, and then things such as timing of application. The, 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 uh, the longer you can go between um, applying manure and harvesting is essential. Uh, for gaps and harmonized gaps, and even for the National Organic Program, 120 days is a minimum. Wildlife management. This is critical uh, because a lot of outbreaks, uh, particularly out in the West, uh, have occurred because of wildlife contamination. Uh, we need to scout for wildlife uh, in your fields the same way you would for insects and diseases. And pre-harvest assessments are important, so to check out the crops, looking for signs of contamination before uh, you harvest or sending a crew out to harvest. And this is where, again, training of your, of your harvest crew is important so that they know what to look for as well. And then looking what, what ways can we, can we reduce wildlife from, from getting into, into the crops, some sort of barriers, deterrence, repellents, behavior modifications. These will all be discussed thoroughly at our trainings. Uh, once you harvest crops um, and you need to wash, the, uh, so we're looking, it must be potable water. Using sanitizer is, is, is critically important uh, to keep the water uh, itself clean. You're not trying to sanitize the product, you're trying to keep the water clean from any possible contamination that will then uh, contaminate all the rest of the crop that goes into that wash water. So we, we talk about monitoring and, and ways of keeping, keeping that clean uh, and, and keeping your produce clean. A whole, this is the, washing produce is the one step where you can contaminate a huge amount of, of, of volume of, of product uh, in one fell swoop uh, by not following um, uh, requirements. We'll also look, look at turbidity, when to change your water. Then there's packing house sanitation, keeping things clean, uh, keeping out ro uh, rodents, pets, uh, cats may be good mousers, but they're terrible uh, for, for getting into things where you don't want them to be and possibly passing diseases. Looking at setting up facilities uh, so that you have a dirty side and a clean side, uh, making sure that you're not having any cross-contamination. And finally, traceability. Where does, where does your product come from and where does it go? So it's kind of looking at one step forward, one step back. This requires a lot of documentation. It's manageable uh, if you or have it organized. And this is, we spent a lot of time on traceability. We want to keep track of when and where everything came from and where and when it was going out. So labeling is, is important so that we, can, we cover all aspects of, uh, of how to uh, make sure that this is an efficient and, and cost-effective way of, of keeping track of your produce. And now Stephanie will present on the two-day GAPS training courses. Okay, so um, after a long um, period of growers going through the food safety planning process, um, we've actually surveyed data on, um, we have a survey um, of the growers who have attended and um, a lot of them have a plan regardless of the need for audit. Um, and you develop your own unique produce safety plan and how to use it through the two-day um, training course. Um, New York State Department of Ag and Markets usually attends, and um, they're the third-party auditors that are typically used. And you can get a USDA certification uh, um, um, through this process. In day two, um, is really the where you get down to nitty, the nitty gritty. On day one, you actually cover a lot of the topics that Robert had just presented. Um, on day two, you take that information and you start writing your, your food safety plan. Um, 
your own unique plan has to match your own unique farming enterprise. Everybody is different. Um, it's great to bring a farm map um, so you can lay out your farming practices on that and um, plan for your food safety, um, your food safety plan. New York Ag and Markets auditors are available the second day to answer questions as well as um, cooperative extension educators and um, GAP personnel. And this is going back to Elizabeth Newbold. So uh, the, the, these, this two-day training has actually been in development since 1999 and has been in its current form since 2009 after several iterations. Uh, Cornell really worked to see what worked best for growers and um, for the growing needs of the New York uh, produce industry. Uh, and so what we did is this past spring, we actually took the time to do a long-term look-back evaluation. So after having this training for many years, we weren't really sure of the impact that it had on a number of um, things, both how effective it was in getting growers prepared for third-party audits and for meeting their uh, market demands, whether that be actually going through an audit or just having a farm food safety plan or implementing um, some farm food safety measures on the farm. And we also wanted to find out what the economic impact was on growers. So we know that there were costs associated with implementing these practices on the farm, but nobody really knew how much there was. There was uh, sort of estimations on what was thought, but actually talking to growers who had done this hadn't um, actually been completed. So we took the time last spring to go back and talk to 80 farms who have participated in the two-day training since 2009. And we asked them a series of questions ranging from um, why did you attend training? Do you have a farm food safety plan? Do you have third-party audits? And how much have you spent implementing gaps on your farm? And everything from a few dollars for buying labels all the way to thousands of dollars because they were installing new, co new coolers or um, building new packing houses. Uh, so we really tried to capture the entire spectrum of costs. And after that, we asked them if they were doing this because uh, their market were asking them to implement gaps, and if so, how much money were they maintaining in sales with those buyers um, that would have been lost had they not implemented gaps, and if now because they had gaps they were able to expand into markets they previously did not have access to. So um, to start, what we'll talk about here on this slide is looking at completed farm food safety plans. So this was an important question because developing a written farm food safety plan is valuable since it helps guide the implementation of gaps on the farm and it's required if a farm needs to have a third party audit in order to meet buyer demand. So the, the beginning piece of this was really how many growers are now completing their farm food safety plan. And talking to growers um, at trainings and then through this follow-up evaluation we could see that on their own, only 13% of growers had completed a farm food safety plan. At the end of the two-day training, as Stephanie was mentioning, the second day is completely devoted to writing the farm food safety plan. We saw 48% um, had a completion of 100% of their farm food safety plan. And then going home, they then had the tools after attending the training to complete that farm food safety plan on their own. And we saw that after training, 63% of growers completed that plan once they got home because they now had the tools um, to do that on their own. The next, one of the other reasons, uh, things that we, we looked, talked to these growers about was why did they implement gaps on their farm at all? Um, we were sort of under the impression that 
one of the the main reason was because buyers were demanding it of their growers to be implementing uh, gaps on the farm. And what we found was that actually the number one reason with 24% was the growers' personal commitment to food safety. So above and beyond everything else, uh, the number one reason was that growers just want to produce a safe product. And so coming to the training and and implementing some amount of uh, food safety on their farm was so that they knew that they were producing a safer product for, uh, for the consumer. Uh, the second was reducing, um, uh, the second reason at 20% was actually the maintaining market access. So what we thought would be number one, maintaining market access was actually the second driving reason for growers implementing uh, gaps on the farm. And then you can see the the remainder of the reasons sort of were very small percentages that, you know, gaining access to new markets, regulations related to FISMA receiving higher prices um, because of membership requirements would be like a CSA or a UPIC type of a operation. And then very few individuals who had attended, um, only four farms who had actually attended the training in the past went home and did nothing. So that was a really um, stark showing to us that a huge percentage of those farmers who attended the training took something home and implemented something that they learned on their farm. And so in terms of the costs associated, this is always the big question that we get is people, growers want to know how much will implementing gaps cost? And um, of course, the answer is it depends. Um, it's a very complex question because this includes a variety of things, uh, time to develop your farm food safety plan, establish good record keeping practices, training workers. In some cases, some farms have actually hired more people um, just to run their GAPS uh, program on their farm. They've invested in infrastructure and equipment and have made huge improvements uh, to meet the needs of, of farm food safety. Um, so depending on how much your farm would like to do, how much it costs to implement GAPS is, is really very, it varies. Some farms it was just a few hundred dollars, other farms it was thousands of dollars because they chose to build a new packing house. Uh, so that's a really, it's a very complex question. Um, but what we did find was that no matter the farm size, regardless of farm size, the money that was spent implementing gaps resulted in a larger return despite the initial and ongoing costs. So what that means is those growers, you can see here that uh, we found that 43% of growers reported maintaining sales valued from 14,000 to $2 million. And what that represents is those growers had been asked by their buyers to implement uh, food safety and gaps on their farm. Had they chosen not to do it, that value, the 14,000 to 2 million, would have been lost sales. So because they implemented um, gaps on their farm, they were able to maintain that market. In addition, we found that 16% of growers reported that because they had gaps on their farm, they were now able to expand sales either by gaining access to new markets or because their current buyers were now buying more from them because they were GAP certified. And we saw that to be a value between 15,000 and 300,000. So what we found was that for those who implemented GAPs on their, on their farm, the initial investment that they made, we found that regardless of farm size and looking at the costs, the initial costs and ongoing costs that you will have to pay for maintaining um, gaps on the farm, there was actually a greater return. So the amount of money that they spent, they made more than that in either maintaining their existing sales or expanding into new sales. And we will be continuing to analyze this information that we collected further so that we can actually break it down in the future to show um, categories of farm sizes in you know, smaller farms, this is what you can gauge for what it might cost middle size and larger. Um, so keep your, keep tuned and we will um, have that information uh, hopefully later this year, 2015.
Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, and I'm back with the FISMA update, the Food Safety Modernization Act, Act update. Um, and what I'm going to cover is what's going on with the feds, the exemption clarification, the manure rule, water testing rule, and the differences between farm harvest practices and processing. Um, the Food Safety Modernization Act and pro proposed produce safety rule was signed into law in 2011, um, but the draft was released in 2013. Um, produce safety regula regulation one of six um, regulates one of six major preventative control areas. Um, focus on the growing, harvesting, post-harvest handling of fresh produce. So, um, pretty much any produce practice is covered under this: um, growing, harvesting, washing, grading of the produce. Um, and it's focusing on the prevention and not detection of issues. There are um, certain products out of scope and in scope, and there are going to be some exemptions that I'll talk about, but basically food that isn't eaten raw or um, commonly eaten raw, those are out of scope, such as canned produce, grains that are cooked, um, produce that is cooked. In scope but exempt include raw produce, but typically it aren't eaten raw. So uh, those those type of products have an exemption, and then um, in scope and the ones that are really being focused on are the products eaten raw, especially sprouts, um, typically raw produce and mushrooms. Um, so pr the proposed exemptions um, include um, produce that's rarely consumed raw um, and produce destined for a kill step processing. Um, that includes the canned tomatoes, anything heated like that. Um, produce for personal or on-farm consumption. So if you're not selling the pro produce, that, that's exempt. So personal gardens are not going to be um, covered under this regulation. And um, if, you, if the, the farm makes less than $25,000 in, in all food sales in a three-year average, those, those farms will be exempt from this regulation as well. Um, there is um, an FDA resource that you can review to understand the exemptions further called Produce Safety, Does This Rule Apply to You? Um, but remember, the gr growers may be exempt from the regulation, but not the marketplace. Again, as Elizabeth described, um, the second reason most growers um, did, did the food safety planning was because it was market driven. Um, if buyers are requiring a food safety plan, that's something you're going to have to consider. Um, the manure rule, water testing rule, and harvest practices versus processing um, under the Food Safety Modernization Act has changed um, and, and have growers concerned. Um, proposed regulations include weekly water testing, and the concern with that is it can be costly um, and it's difficult to find um, certified labs that, that can do that. Um, the accessibility to those is, is limited. <clears throat> um, manure application under FISMA um, has not been um, specified at this point. They, they're waiting for more scientific research until that's available. And um, currently, we're just using, growers are using the 120 day standard that we had been. Um, but it does look like they're, they're looking into the, the scientific research behind um, what would be best for that um, rule. Um, under FISMA, normal harvest practices such as trimming tops have been considered a processing step, so growers are concerned um, that they're going to be non-exempt by just topping off products such as leeks or um, other produce. So just by cleaning up the produce for sale, um, they're concerned that that might be considered a processing step and um, growers are very concerned about that. And uh, this is going to go back to Robert. Okay. There's a, we've covered in a very short amount of time a lot of information, and I'm sure everybody listening to this, their heads are swimming. 
So we will be having trainings coming up. Uh, we normally do in the in the late winter, early spring. And you can stay tuned to what may be in your area through the updates on the Cornell's National GAPS website, www.gaps.cornell.edu. Um, we do carry uh, uh, on with our trainings, as, as mentioned before, we go into two-day trainings. Uh, and this is a collaboration between the National GAPS program, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, and we couldn't do it without the assistance of New York State Department of Ags and Markets and through the Produce Safety Alliance. New York Ag and Markets has been instrumental uh, because they, they come from the inspection side, the auditing side of things, and so they're able to uh, give information to growers that, are, that, are, that may cover things that are unique just to uh, certain farm situations. The next set of uh, trainings are March 10th and 11th, 2015 in Canton, New York. The organizer for that is Paul Hetzler. And March 17th and 18th uh, in Arcade, New York, this is a rescheduled training that got snowed out uh, a, a little while ago. And the organizer is Wyoming County C CCE uh, agent Don Gusowitz. March 24th and 25th up in Plattsburgh, New York, and the organizer for that is Anna Wallace. There will be um, some specific uh, trainings later this spring, uh, looking at wash water sanitation, small scale uh, facility design workshops. Um, there will be training focused on low cost, low tech, wash pack layouts, uh, product flow, wash water sanitation, post harvest handling. Uh, and a variety of things related to that. These are half-day programs. The first one would be March 9th, 2015 uh, in um, Finger Lakes area. Stay tuned for more information on that, as well as the one in March 23rd in Ithaca area. And then later in, in the spring, there will be one uh, down in the Kanajahari uh, area, Mohawk Valley. And we'd like to thank Gretchen Wall from the Cornell Produce Safety Alliance uh, for her great picture taking, and we give her lots of credit for that. Thank you. So that's the end of our uh, webinar today. And um, just like to say that the multi-day GAPS training programs are helping growers increase their understanding of produce safety issues, develop a written farm food safety plan, and implement practices to reduce microbial risks. So if you have further questions, please give any of us a call and feel free to, to reach out. Thanks so much.